Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, I wanted to discuss active imagination, meeting the shadow and uh, well, I suppose whatever else comes up as well from that because uh, those two subjects are quite expansive in themselves uh, and I want to really talk from quite a pragmatic and practical viewpoint on these things. Um, because that's really the best way to talk about them. I kind of like to discuss psychology in practical ways, because the thing is, when you're taught psychology at university level, which is what I'm doing at the moment, you're kind of taught uh, a very, very scientific way. So the scientific way allows for brilliant understanding of things and brilliant sort of concreteness, shall we say, in uh, objective understanding with regards to sort of research reports and things like that. But you don't really get as much of a real practical sort of base understanding of certain uh, actual empirical phenomenon and then being able to use that understanding to actually manipulate and uh, actually kind of grow your own psychology and help your own psychology or help the psychology of others. So that's why I kind of like to take more of a pragmatic approach um, because of course you've got the one side that is pragmatic in an objective way and then you've got the other side which is pragmatic in a subjective way. So uh, I want to talk on, talk about these less so in conceptual terms, but more so in informal and um, slightly practical terms of what they mean and how is the best way to go about these things uh, and how we can make sure that we're not falling into pitfalls and things like that within them. So I'll just tilt my mic over there a little bit because OBS is going a bit mad with me. Um, so, active imagination. First off, I would say we have to be very, very careful with active imagination. Now, I've not necessarily been doing active imagination uh, consciously, shall we say, for that long. I've probably been doing it for... I think it was last summer I started it properly. And obviously, previous to that, I was doing dream interpretation without active imagination. Now, um, when I kind of went into active imagination, not only did it blow things up in terms of understanding the unconscious more, but it sent me back quite nostalgic to a time in um, my teenage years when I would fantasize quite a lot. Um, and I realized in the context of my personal journey, what active imagination actually is. So if you're not familiar with it, active imagination is basically a process of, uh, I like to call it souped up daydreaming. That's my kind of little phrase for it, because it's not daydreaming specifically um because daydreaming has more of an element of like full conscious control to it but it's partially daydreaming and it's kind of like this souped up version of daydreaming because what you're doing is you're basically getting yourself into a somewhat meditative um experience Wherever it may be, I mean, you can generally you can do it anywhere. I mean, I I've I've done it walking before, just like when uh, the Zen guys or when all these other you know the Buddhists and the Taoists and stuff talk about walking meditation. Um, just the same, you can do active imagination while you're walking. Although um, you have to kind of let go to the images when they're springing up, um, and it's. I suppose you really, really have to go back into childhood, that childhood mentality, um, to be able to really do that when you're walking. When you're, let's say you're lying on the bed or you're sitting down somewhere and 
you're kind of closing your eyes, you're just sort of, I was going to say waiting, but more just absorbing in the experience around you, and then suddenly an image pops up in your mind, and that image comes to life, and then there's a scene that develops from that, and then the scene turns into uh, all sorts of different characters, and there's all sorts of different things going on throughout this scene, it turns into different landscapes, and uh, different things going on, and then of course you can get into the place in which people are talking to you within active imagination. Now, there's there's two dimensions of experience with people talking to you in active imagination that I've been able to get to. One is the more meditative, really, really letting go, and then it almost, it, it feels quite crazy actually when it happens, because you let go in meditation in a state of active imagination so much that you go into this uh, almost dream world, which you're still awake, you're still conscious, but you're kind of in that, in a very, very, very relaxed state, almost as if you're close to falling asleep, but you're not asleep. Um, and you're not really, I mean, it might be considered that you could say that you're partially or quarter asleep or getting there, but you're fundamentally, you're more awake than you are asleep. And uh, you absorb into this dream world so much that you hear the voices of these people talking quite spontaneously and separate from your thoughts necessarily producing them. Or what, what I should say is because, of course, it's always going to be your thoughts producing them because it's your brain producing those figures, but your conscious thoughts producing them. So it's... Uh, the unconscious within you playing and and elaborating and talking to you, let's say. It's your unco unconscious talking to yourself. Um, and so you get this experience and these people really quite clearly talk to you and then you come out of it. And sometimes it might only last very briefly or you might get a little bit more, but it's very, very hard, I've found, to sustain that level of active imagination while these voices are very, very clearly talking to you from your unconscious um, for any length, uh, any amount of time. The other dimension of active imagination that you can get into with uh, figures talking to you is a little bit more conscious and it creates more of a dialogue with the unconscious in more of a conscious setting. Now, what I believe is that Jung was able to get to the first portion of talking to dream figures that I mentioned, that which was when you're in a very, very relaxed conscious state and you talk to these dream figures, but he was able to do it for a remarkable length of time, whereas I can't seem to do that, and I don't think there's many people who can seem to do that. I think that... Um, for some reason, because maybe because of his intellect, I don't know, maybe just the way that he was training at active imagination or his training at meditation and things like that, uh, he was able to do that for a lot longer than other people can. But there's another area of active imagination where you can lie down or you can sit down and you can get into sort of a half meditative state. And you can open up a dialogue with an unconscious figure that comes and it's partially within your control and then there's a partial autonomy with the unconscious. But there's not as much autonomy as when you really go into that deeper realm that's a lot harder to get to. Now, I've not really um, trained too much at the moment in really getting into that deeper realm because I've only really started to experience that deeper realm uh, more prominently recently over the last two or three months, something like that. And so my, uh, uh, what's the word, aspiration is to try and get into that a bit more. Now, the way I've found the best to get into that from just the, the experiences that I've had recently is to do it at night time before you go to bed. So you're literally in bed and you 
it's weird because you can you can almost call to your unconscious and you can sort of get into this dimension of experience in which you think and you go to the unconscious almost um i don't want to call it astral projection because that's not what it is in this context it's just you open yourself up to the blackness within your mind so imagine you've got your eyes closed and you sort of obviously you, you're you're awake uh, you're not necessarily uh, going to sleep ne- uh, completely but you're in bed and you're in that relaxed mentality so you close your eyes and uh, then you just open up to the blackness of the unconscious and then this dialogue or these figures if you're lucky will come to you other you know otherwise what'll happen is you'll just go to sleep you'll just fall asleep as normal but sometimes these figures will come to you and then you will have this dialogue and and that's the best way to to get into that state of imagination that's deeper because what happens is you slowly get closer to falling asleep and it's at that po- uh, moment where these figures and I had one the other night actually not not too long ago and uh it was a very, very brief thing. As I said, it's very, very hard to get into these moments for, for long periods of time. It was a very, very brief thing. And uh, it was like this old man. And he was uh, he had like sort of a hat on and he had uh, some sort of staff. It was like a cool staff. Obviously, you know, like a wise old man, sage-like figure, archetype. Um, and he was stood down this sort of... Um, almost road but it was an indoor it was in it was indoors and it was like a an indoor place that was kind of rounded like that and there was this road and there was all these tiles and the tiles got gradually smaller in the design um going up to the um up well up to this uh, mandala and so he was there and I forgot, he did say something, I forgot, I don't know whether I actually wrote that one down, because I have so many of these active imagination things, that I don't write them all down, it's just too, it's ridiculous, because when you dream with a certain frequency, like a lot of us do, um, like for example myself, I at least have one one dream a night, Some sometimes I'll go through periods where like, you know, four or five days will pass and randomly I won't have a dream, but then other times I'll have literally a dream a night for three weeks and sometimes I'll have like two or three dreams a night on random nights and I'll be like I just can't write them all down you know you just can't do it but I try my best and I wrote down um I had three dreams last night no not last night night before uh and I I have wrote down two or three of them but I write them down in quite good detail well if I can I write them down in quite good detail so I can get good chunky paragraphs um and so, obviously, you can tell even just writing that down without an in- interpretation. You're looking at, if you've got three dreams and you're writing them down in good detail, you're looking at an hour and a half, two hours of just writing those dreams down. So that's why I like to get up if I can at like seven, although more recently I haven't been doing that. And then, obviously, I've got the time before, let's say, I need to go to a lecture or whatever it may be um, to be able to write those down. And it's not kind of impeding or, or getting into the rest of the day. Um, I always make the joke, actually, that if you're a psychoanalyst or if you're anyone who's into dream interpretation, uh, you're a Jungian or whatever it may be, um, uh, dream, dream interpreters don't even get sleep as as a time off. You know, normal people, at least, even if they're working like, you know, 10 hours a day or whatever, they'll get to go to bed and they'll have a rest. But dream, interpretation, uh, dream interpreters don't even get sleep as time off. So that's a... It is a bugger because you're like, God, you go you go to sleep and you're like, I really want a dream tonight. I really want a dream. But when you think, yeah, but if I have a dream, I'm going to feel compelled to write it down the next morning. I'm like, oh, God, no, I've got to do all that. So it's like, you, you, there's no respite. There's no respite, but it's fun. And I, I love the, um, I love the dreams because they're so intricate and they're so, um, tasty and they've got so much richness to them but anyway so that was one of the things and that was one of the times in which the figure spoke to me without me having any conscious input that was just completely spontaneous and again those can be somewhat frequent but you have to try and put yourself into the experiences of being able to do that um 
And certainly it's a process of training your um, your awareness to do that and do that and do that. So anyway, this it, uh, this guy spoke to me, this sage-like figure, and I think he said something like, um, I swear it was something like, don't worry, Adam, just look or something, just, or just relax. It was it's something like that anyway, but um, yeah, so you have those figures, and I remember one night as well, this was really weird, because this was one of the first times I actually had this experience, I was going to sleep, and I was really like half between sleep and waking right at this point, and I had this vision in my mind, and it was basically like of a, um, I would have said like 17 maybe 18th century, probably 18th century, and it was a, a sort of a palace, like in a palace or something like that, and there was these male figures there talking to one another, uh, and I can't remember what he said, and I don't even think, I don't know whether I wrote that one down as well, actually. But that's the other problem as well, you see. If you do it that way, and then you go to sleep, and then you wake up, you probably won't remember, because when you wake up the next morning, you probably won't remember what we said, or if you, uh, I'm trying to do this here, probably won't remember what we said, if you do remember what we said, you might end up forgetting just to write it down anyway, you might end up of had of it having another dream, and you write that one down or whatever, so that's the problem with doing it that way, you, it's hard, um, so yeah, you know, it, so the whole doing it before you go to sleep thing, there is an issue with that. There is there is a fundamental issue with that. Um, so as well as doing doing it that way, it would be a good idea to do it in the day as well if you've got any free time or in the evening um, and try to get into that real meditative experience. But I, but I found it very, very hard if I'm not already just very relaxed, like relaxed down, just about to go to sleep, I find it very, very hard to get into that real meditative state. Now, there's also active imagination experiences um, that are very, very vivid and that are uh, also spontaneous. So in the state of uh, active imagination where you're uh, in sort of a uh, meditation, but like there's there's some level of mediation there between your conscious mind and the unconscious, which is uh, not, let's say, quite as powerful as just the real spontaneity and real, real uh, happenings of the unconscious. But there's some sort of mediation there between the unconscious and the conscious mind. Um, you get uh, you can get these real enhanced visual experiences, but real, real clear, like really clear images and uh, uh, they generally have some level of spontaneity as well. And uh, those can be quite informative and quite powerful. So I'll give you an example from a couple of days ago. I had been slowly getting into this sort of uh, state of active imagination, this mediation between the conscious and unconscious mind. And um, I had had this... Uh, I had seen this child, and this child came to me very, very vividly in, in imagery. Uh, and it was a young girl. She had sort of uh, brown hair, sort of straight. She's probably only seven years old, eight years old, something like that, around that sort of uh, age range. And her mum was there, but then her mum had, had, had gone away. And, and I was in a, sort of a brown like like one of the brown coats I wear, sort of long trench coats and uh, some shirt and stuff. And I seemed to be a lot more responsive or, or I perceived that I was more responsible than I am now. Uh, responsible enough to view myself as a perception in that act of imagination experience as a father or a father figure, shall we say. Um, so anyway, this... Uh, so. I had had to then take care of this little girl. Her mum had gone off. And I think it was actually partially, if I remember rightly, I think it was like kind of partially alluded to that she was going to leave her with me and all the rest of it. Anyway, this this girl, I, I say, go, go and play on the swings there. Don't worry, I'll be here. I'll wait here for you. I'll be looking at you. I'll be watching you. Don't worry. So she goes off. She's a bit, she's a bit uncertain, a bit scared. She's a bit nervous about going off there on her own. 
And she walks over and she goes, uh, opens the gate and goes off and goes to the swing. And suddenly the 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 scene jumps and it's uh, when she's coming out of the playground now, and I'm not there in the in the place where I said I would meet her, right? And uh, she's looking around and uh, and and then so what what's happening now is. Well, actually, I was always on looking the situation. I wasn't really identifying with myself, but I was looking at myself, even though I was aware that I was also myself, if you get my drift. Um, so then I was on looking the experience and she's uh, and, and I'm walking down this way as she's here, you know, looking around like uncertain. Where's he gone? And I, I, I came back and then I said, don't worry, don't worry, I'm here, I'm here. I literally just went over there, it's fine, don't worry, and then gave her a hug. And uh, we kind of atoned, let's say. So that was a very interesting, that was a very, very vivid act of imagination experience. So it wasn't, because uh, some a lot of the time, when you're, let's say, in the beginning stages of of, of reaching that sort of slightly meditative state, you kind of get hazy images that aren't at all very um, clear and some of them start to appear up and they're like, you know, a bit hazy and you're wondering what the scene is and then it starts to get a bit more clear and, and then sometimes you can get to a, a fair level of clarity. But then other times, images will just arise in your mind and they will be crystal clear images as if you're almost looking at another person. It's crazy. Um, and so that was one of those experiences, but, but those experiences are slightly less often, uh, sorry, slightly less common, I should say, than, um, the others. Um, I wouldn't say they're rare, or at least for me, they're not rare. Uh, obviously it'll differ for different people and stuff, but for me, they're not particularly rare, but they're certainly less common than, let's say, another act of imagination scene that, We'll have a little bit of clarity, but not potentially that level of clarity. Uh, now, we need to discuss really the um, the risks of active imagination. Now, this is a bit of an odd one because you, you're going to be thinking risks to active imagination. That seems a bit odd. Um, so there are risks to active imagination. Um, one is that you get yourself into a state of... Uh, Almost not wanting to partake in reality or being withdrawn from reality to a certain degree. So what can happen is you can, uh, and this has happened to me multiple times, multiple times over different periods. And there's been weeks, literally periods of weeks in my life where um, uh, certainly since I've started doing this over the last eight weeks, uh, eight months, where I would just want to go into active imagination all the time. And then I'd come out of it and then I'd go for a period of what I call uh, extroverted realism, which is where you're not partaking in active imagination. The unconscious is in the background and uh, you're just, you know, you're within your daily life and all the rest of it. And you're not really even um, partaking in uh, having many dreams at that time as well and things like that or if you do have dreams they're quite kind of vague and you can't remember many of them and stuff so so there are periods of what I call extroverted realism and they come on you either just naturally as a, as a flow maybe after a time of intense introspection or sometimes you actively uh, kind of embrace the, the, the extroverted conscious world more and so then uh, the unconscious just naturally goes into the background like right now i'm in a i've just come out of an intense period um of about 12 days to 14 days of absolute hell of um active imagination and i'll get on to uh basically the the risks and stuff of active imagination as tied to that as well because it's a good example um so obviously, having come out of such an intense uh, introspection period, which was embracing me unconscious to an incredible degree, now naturally, I uh, it, it wasn't really that it was a natural follow-on, but more so that I had to take back control myself. I had to say, look, I've had this period of this introspection and I need to embrace the world more now. I, I learned certain things within that period, and I could almost start to feel the period coming to an end as well. But I realized I've got to 
embrace the world. Otherwise, it can start to fall into um, uh, a, 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 a bad situation of which you're indulging in fantasies, indulging in fantasies, indulging in fantasies. You're not wanting to actually explore and uh, enjoy uh, your extroverted life. I'm talking socially. I'm talking going out there for walks or going out there for um, doing whatever it is you do in terms of a job, things like that. It really, it impedes you. When I was in the 12 to 14 days of introspection, I didn't want to look at my lectures. I didn't want to look at my lectures. And I was, um, I did, I, I, I managed to just kind of watch my lectures and do that and, uh, but I didn't want to look at it. I didn't want to look at um, anything to do with hard objectivity or anything like that in those 12 to 40. Like, really, I didn't. I just wanted to fantasy, fantasy. I, I wanted to do active imagination. I wanted, that was it. So you see, you get into these periods of which you just uh, indulge in the images. And I think Jung used that word where he was talking about indulging in the images and how you can get uh, tempted by the images and they can kind of take you away from the extroverted life. And there's also an element, personally for me in this as well, and also kind of on a wider scale of anima possession with regards to um, the images being representative of the um, the anima and the enchanting nature of that and the, the kind of... Uh, representations mythologically in kind of the selkies and the sirens and the mermaids and things, well, maybe less of the mermaids, but certainly the selkies and the sirens and those um, uh, sort of sea creatures that have a lovely song or they try and, uh, or they look very, very attractive and they lure someone in and then the person ends up going to the death in the seas and drowns, you see. And that's a, a mythological representation of, um, well, for one, kind of being anima possessed, but also for another, um, partially included in that, in uh, actually indulging in the act of imagination, indulging in fantasies, loads and loads and loads. And then what happens is you become in, uh, completely introverted and you become um, a hollow existence. You don't live. You see, what also happened in those 12 to 14 days for me, and again, it's happened before in previous experience, in previous times of this, is I didn't want to go out for walks. I would I would go on the bed and I would indulge in the fantasies and then I'd write them down, of course. And uh, I would think to myself, well, maybe I'll go on a walk. But then something, an unconscious force, shall we say, was almost in the back of my mind saying, no, 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 stay, stay with the fantasy, stay with the act. You see what I mean? So that's how it can pull you in as well. And it's almost as if something, whatever it is in the unconscious, in Jungian terms, we'd say it's an archetype. In other terms, I, I don't know, you'd have to say it's some sort of unconscious process kind of compelling your behavior in some regard. Um, but there, something grabs you and something directs your behavior and something makes you uh, more sympathetic to indulging in uh, a, more, a more kind of fantasy hollow existence rather than an extroverted real life existence so it's, it can be quite dangerous in that respect now the thing is it normally does come back so even if you do get into one of those periods that are quite in-depth and quite intense and that really just you just don't want any part of extroverted life it will bounce back again. Um, as Jung says, um, uh, the, pendulum, the pendulum of life swings between se uh, sense and nonsense or nonsense. Um, and uh, I never understood that quote for a long time. But when I started active imagination and when I started getting into the real kind of insanity of it or, or what can start to become uh, looking like partial insanity within it, 
you really start to understand that quote, I'll tell you. So um, anyway, so in these experiences of actual imagination, um, there was a clear uh, attribution for me, uh, or for me, I should say, within my interpretations and visions and things like that, of a understanding and an integration of the anima or the feminine side. Now, I won't say that, of course, uh, that it's any level of the high integration with that particular archetype that I was coming across there, but it was merely a, um, let's say, a, um, a meeting with the anima, in a sense. And uh, so it was like a preliminary meeting with the anima, this kind of experience of 12 to 14 days. And uh, prior to this, I had, because uh, I look at my poetry quite a lot, um, and poetry, there's a lot of unconsciousness even in, in poetry, even if you are quite aware of the unconscious yourself. Because when you're writing poetry, you just let it flow, especially if you're writing poetry in the good uh, way of writing poetry, which is when you're in a creative spur, then the words flow onto the page and that's your unconscious, that's the fantasies speaking through you. Because you're when you're writing, you're envisioning these words and these fantasies and these little um, situations, fantasy situations, and you're then writing them straight down on the page without too much as well, if you get into a good experience of writing poetry, without too much of really your conscious awareness or, well, not conscious awareness, but conscious direction. Um, so I noticed that I had wrote down a poem um, that was actually, you know what, I should read it out because that might be quite, quite an interesting one to read out. Uh, where is it now? It's not. Poem's not called Unicorn's Blood, I don't think. Or is it called Unicorn's Blood? Oh, no, it is called Unicorn's Blood. Rainbow colours from Persona Pixies, dumped in batter and pulled out clean, fried, sugared and whacked, plastic windows packed. Mmm, myself, such a tasty donut, divinity enlivened by a foot, spark the serenity by words of an arch enemy. Spread the unicorn's blood over my disgustingly tainted mud. Fire up the vessel. Watch the unicorn's colours wrestle. Move. Quick now. Here he comes. Are you still scared of the gums? They are here to co coagulate you clean. The fire burns. Watch it beam. After the fire has rotted the impure, ads and bads will be mature. Whole, young foal, forever directed to your goal. And anyway, I wrote that poem uh, and, and, I, and I put unicorn's blood in it. And then on another day, I had a little bit, uh, no, well, then on another day, I uh, had had it, that was it. Then on another day, I had a fantasy about a unicorn. Then on another day, I had watched something online, uh, a music video from an artist I quite like called Trippy Red. If you haven't checked out Trippy Red, he's a good uh, rapper. And he, he had a little visualization of a unicorn on that thing. Then on another day, this was like the next day, I had a Snapchat story with me, uh, a Bitmoji story on Snapchat. And I look at the Bitmoji stories on Snapchat quite a lot because they are quite synchronous. They're weirdly synchronous. Very, very odd. Um, although then again, how much of that is wishful thinking and how much is synchronicity? Again, you know, we get into that debate. But some of the experiences I've had with Bitmoji stories have been, God, clearly synchronous and it's not causal at all. This one, okay, yeah, you could probably put it down to a bit of causality. But still, anyway, I had this Bitmoji story. And then there was this rainbow. Uh, sorry, there was this unicorn who was a little bit rainbowy on uh, the Bitmoji story, talking to me up in like some sort of, God, I don't know, some sort of weird heaven-like place or something. Anyway, I then, uh, it was, no, it was on that same day I had that Bitmoji story, I looked into the unicorn in, in kind of alchemy and, and things like that. And, and other uh, kind of just generally the symbolism of it. And... Uh, 
I saw a quote from Jung that basically talked about how the unicorn can be a symbol of masculinity and femininity, the two kind of combining. And uh, there's also kind of links to the feminine and things there generally and stuff with the unicorn. And I thought, well, this is really, really weird. Um, and so this was all kind of prior or maybe just in the very, very beginning stages of the experiences of uh, the act of imagination, which all ended up centering around the anima, which all ended up centered, uh, a lot of the visions and a lot of the things like that centered around uh, the uh, the understanding and the playing of the anima within my, within my own conscious and, of course, within images within my conscious mind. Now, this is another one of the dangers in active imagination. The Jungians say, um, well, Alan Watts said about, because Alan Watts had a few uh, Jungian friends, and uh, he said that the Jungians that he used to know, I think it was in, in New York, were very afraid of going, and these are practically his exact words, were very afraid of going into the unconscious, because things in the unconscious, in his words, uh, the primordial slime, and uh, things can come up and invade your consciousness. This is exactly what he said. And uh, I i didn't really get that quote for a while. Um, and it's been on my mind for quite a while because I, I know uh, Alan Watts uh, from his uh, work and from his autobiography and things like that. Uh, or I feel like, as if I know him quite well. But the thing that's always puzzled me is that I've, I've always wanted to know whether he indulged in dreams to a certain degree. Now, I've not read his book. It's up there, actually, Psychotherapy East and West. And he might touch about dreams more in that. And then that might give me an inkling to his personal experience with indulging in dream interpretation. But it's very likely that at one stage in his life, he did indulge in dream interpretation because he seems to be quite clued up with things about the unconscious. So you don't really get to that sort of level without at least doing a year's worth of dream interpretation or anything like that. So anyway, he said that these things can come up and invade your consciousness. And I was like, at first, I didn't really get it. Like, I kind of partially understood it, but... I didn't really get it because I hadn't had the experiences. But then a few months ago, I started to have more of these experiences with archetypes literally coming through me, like coming through in my speech and things like that. When I would get into uh, sort of partially meditative states, I could talk to myself. And Marie Louise von Franz talks about this as well. Um, and it's almost kind of like, the old idea of possession in um, Christianity and things like that, though not quite to that extreme, let's say, because there's still a level of conscious control there. But, you know, there's these, literally these, well, the only way I could describe them is kind of archetypal forms coming through my speech and speaking to me within my speech. And... Um, then, in this experience, this, 10, this 12, 14 day experience, whatever, I uh, had some meetings with uh, ter a terrible, like, uh, a terrible mother like figure. Now, I've had many dreams, one of which was an incredibly harrowing dream of a terrible mother like figure. It was basically a woman who wa was reminiscent of some uh, a woman let's say off one of the paranormal activity movies um in terms of one of the possessed women off off that right not a nice image in a dream and i had a dream once where there was these uh three people in a house i think it was one guy and two girls or it might have been two guys and one girl doesn't matter too much anyway they were all getting haunted by the ghosts of children now, if, of course, you're a psychoanalyst, you'll be able to pinpoint my complexes here quite easily because this dream really does tell you one of my, my main complexes like that. Um, but I've talked about uh, certain of my own complexes anyway before, so I'm, so I'm sure even if you're not a psychoanalyst, you'll be familiar with that. 
But anyway, so I uh, was watching these three scenes in the same house play out with these different people. And they were being haunted by the ghosts of children. And uh, there was a couple of girl children and one boy children or uh, one boy child or two bo- uh, girl children and one um, one boy. Is that the right way? Anyway, you know, there was a couple of girls, a couple of guys or one guy, a couple of girls. And... Um, the suspense was building and these individuals couldn't seem to realize that these uh, invisible ghost children were there. And I was, I was as the onlooker thinking, God, God, please notice them, please notice them, please notice them. And we didn't notice them, didn't notice them. And uh, anyway, it kind of got to a bit of an anticlimax where the children didn't, if I remember rightly, although I would have to go back and check the because it was quite a while ago, but where the children seem to, they might have slightly scared them, but not really, it wasn't like a crazy scare. But then what happened was one of the women uh, basically like looked in the mirror or looked around and saw this bloody woman who was stood there, possessed as hell, and it was a very clear image in my mind, so you can imagine it, it was not a nice dream. Um, this woman possessed as hell, pale skin, so like blue skin or green skin, it was one or the other, um, and just, you know, horrible eyes and all ragged hair, all sort of clothes ripped down the sides and everything, she was a horrible looking figure, and of course then I woke up from the dream and all the rest of it and thought, sugar, and I had to, after that dream, I... Uh, had the experience, now I've had this experience many times since, of that dream figure actually being in reality. So what I mean by that is I wake up and I feel, obviously I know consciously that that person isn't in the room or anything, but I feel as if that dream image, that archetype is still with me in my conscious, in my consciousness. Um, and that was a that was an interesting um that was an interesting experience. But then what happened in these twelve to fourteen days, which leads on from that, that's why I was telling you about that, was uh this image comes up again early on in these in this introspection period. And uh, I'm going through hell at this time because Basically, I, I said on one of the other videos about my expansive personality and stuff, and that I segment, or, well, it's kind of that conceptually I segment my personality in terms of, like, Zarino and Bads and Mabel and Kriffney and all the rest of it, but that's only a conceptual distinction on the actual phenomenon that I'm observing. Those phenomenon, i.e. those perceptual changes in how I view my personality, are a rea- reality. They actually exist, but obviously the names for them that I give are just just names. They they're by the by, really. Um, but it's just that when Zarino comes in, it's easy to give that certain perception on my personality the name Zarino, or it's easy um, to give the name to uh, certain, let's say, comments I might that might come up in my my mind. Um, let's say, uh, what could be considered slight misogynistic comments and things like that, the shadow, bad, you know, and, and so, or, uh, when I'm certain, when I'm acting a certain way as well, uh, then of course that's bad. So it's easy just to give those certain partial, uh, perceptions on personality and also partial behavioral tendencies as just, just names just to categorize them so I so I can deal with it more in my personality rather than it all being like well there's this and then there's this and then there's this and um well yeah okay that makes up me as Adam but it feels disjointed if I would wouldn't give them those names it feels unfamiliar to me if I didn't give them those names um so anyway what was I talking about I know I was talking about that, that woman um Oh yeah, that was it. So I, I was going through hell at this period, and my um, all of the male ideas or, or, or behavioral tendencies seemed to 
fail on me, for literally collapse in on themselves. And I felt as if I only had Antalya, Mabel, and another side of my personality that I didn't mention in the expansive personality video, Bonnie. Now, Bonnie is the seductive, um, overdeveloped Eros um, in Jungian terms, uh, kind of uh, bitch type. You know, the kind of the evil, sly, bitchy side of a woman. That's that's Bonnie in my personality. Uh, Antalio is the the uncertain, feminine, the anima, the um but the, the very kind of um the, the the woman who's very kind of uh let's say closed off, shy, that's all. that's within Antalya, let's say. There's more to Antalya than that, but that's within Antalya. Um, and then, of course, Mabel is the older woman, all the rest of it, the, the uh, grandma-type figure, or, you know, the certainty, all that sort of stuff, the, the maturing into life, the, 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 the feminine who's solid, who's well-rounded, all the rest of it. And within Mabel, there's, of course, a little bit of Bonnie, and within Mabel, there's a little bit of Antalya and all the rest of it. And expressed as potential within Antalya, uh, that Mabel is within Antalya as a certain potential, Bonnie's within Antalya as a certain potential, um, Antalya's within Bonnie as a certain potential and a certain uh, ability that Bonnie doesn't portray because she's representative of a certain um, behavioral tendency and things like that. And of course, all of these uh, names represent archetypes as well. And I have actually got um, a psyche diagram, which actually pinpoints all of these different behavioral tendencies that I have as specific archetypes, because that's what they are. They align to specific archetypes. Um, but anyway, so what I, what I had like a, shall we say, a partial ego death, not a full ego death by any means, but a partial ego death where this masculine side had gone, had been cut off. And uh, so I went through all these visions of uh, these uh, different women and uh, different uh, things coming to me. And uh, I totally felt alienated from myself and... Um, uh, I felt completely cut away from my masculinity, like there was no relationship with masculinity there whatsoever. Um, I got into an experience of um, indulging in the shadow quite heavily. And what I mean by that is I, w I was kind of ripped open and the shadow was all that lay behind my experience. And I've wrote all this down in my dream book. I wrote down all the experiences. And um, then I got to the understanding that behind every single point of my word, behind every single um, word that came out of my mouth, I was insincere about. I was a persona about. So when I say I was a persona, I mean to say that um, I was putting on a front for manipulation or for... Um, just for fun, for the for the kind of negative aspect of, uh, let's say, a divine child or something like that, and so I got whipped back, and I, I and I couldn't speak. I one one day actually, I didn't. I, I practically I, I I did speak, but I I really didn't want to speak at all, and I spoke very 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 sparingly because I couldn't confront even my own speech. I couldn't confront even speaking because I knew that every word that came out of my mouth, not only was it in archetypal form, but it was completely insincere and completely based on um, the shadow, completely based on um, just my own gain with, with people. And then it was then, uh, well, now looking back on it, I realized, because I've had many, many experiences with this idea of, of Alan Watts with, um, uh, you know, explore the idea that you are completely selfish, that there's not a selfless part to you. And I've had many experiences with that and experimenting with it over, over a number of months even. But this experience actually pointed to it and actually said, look, Look in your psyche, look at the depths, and you see you are, you are insincere 
to the exact fact of what it means to be insincere. And it made me look at my persona completely, it made me look at the disintegration um, between, well, the interplaying between my shadow and my persona, but also the disintegration uh, between those two uh, structures and the external world as well. And it was a, it was a literally a ripping out of my personality and then a, a kind of reformulation of it. It was ridiculous. Um, so anyway, then what happened was, uh, or during this experience, what happened was I, I'd get these figures of, of this, as I say, that's that kind of possessed woman type figure coming up again. It was almost the exact same, same image. And, uh, so one night I, I got in the shower and this was one of the nights where I was just indulging in the fantasies and um, I wasn't going out of my room much. I wasn't talking to the flatmates at all much. Uh, they knew, uh, at kind of, well, coming to the end of this period, they knew um, what sort of was, in part, they knew what sort of things were happening in terms of, I was going through this intense period of introspe introspection all the rest of it and this instability. Um, but anyway, on one of these nights, I got in the shower. And in these periods of intense introspection, in this kind of, let's say, Im um, active imagination uh, chamber that you're in throughout these days, um, you can get respite. There can be periods of the day in which, like, the images don't spontaneously push through you. But the images just come up a lot of the time whenever. So you're watching, you know, you try, let's say you're trying to watch something or you're, you're on a walk or you're trying to speak to people. The images just push through you and come to you. Um, but anyway, I went for a shower. And I got in the shower and I closed the shower curtain. And I had this horrible experience, which was where I felt, and it was, and it was a, uh, this was literally a mild psychotic delusion. And this is the other, this is the problem with this, uh, with active imagination as well, is you can get to experiences in which replicate, let's say, the, the idea and the, uh, the phenomena of a, a mild psychotic experience. And when I say mild, I do mean mild because psychotic experiences in a more prevalent form are way more than this. But um, you can get into a period of, of sort of these very mild psychotic uh, delusions and, and tendencies and things like that. So anyway, I was in the shower and it felt completely as if there was a woman even though I knew, I knew in my conscious mind that there wasn't, there wasn't a woman there, but it felt as if completely there was. Behind the shower curtain, there was this woman standing there, possessed. And I was well aware of the relations to the complex, and I was well aware of what that woman symbolised as an archetypal form. And uh, she was stood there and then she was reaching or trying to reach through the curtain, the shower curtain, to pull out my heart. You know, kind of like a deaf demon type thing like that. Um, the anima, the anima is a deaf demon, right? So, um, I was really nervous. I was really scared. I was like, oh, you know, I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this. And of course, you always what goes through your mind Um He's like, God, this is going too far. This is good. I can imagine it's similar, although uh, I can imagine this be be way worse. Um, but I can imagine it's sort of getting to that period of where you're like sort of on drugs and you can't and you want to get off them, but you can't uh, in terms of like you. I mean, in the during the experience. So you want the experience to stop, but you can't. Uh, I suppose it's like a mild version of that as well. But anyway, so she's reaching in and, and like grab my heart and then she like tried to do this a few times and I was kind of struggling and then I just stopped and I said look I'm not gonna fight you anymore just do what you have to do and then anyway she just stops she just like stops nothing no, I, 
I mean, I have to check my dream uh, book, but I don't think anything actually happened. Um, she just kind of stopped, and then I opened the curtain, of course, and then there was nothing there, obviously. Um, so there was other nights towards the end of this where I, I saw this woman more and more and more. And um, now I have an anima figure who... As far as I can discern, represents the, let's say, like, the anima development at Mary or something like that, or possibly the anima development at Sophia. But we must understand that I've my anima development is terribly poor. It's at Eve. My anima development, as I've said before, well, de depends whether this video comes out after or before the individuation video. Um, but as I've said before... Uh, or as I've said in the future, uh, my anim anime development is at Eve. It's really, really low. But for some reason, I have this anima figure that comes to me and that's been coming to me for many, many, many months called Aralyn. And the name popped out of the unconscious one night. Literally, um, one night I was just going, just before I'd gone to sleep, uh, the, the, this tech, Text came before my eyes when I was closed my eyes like that. Text came before my eyes and 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 it said her name is Aralyn. And I looked up Aralyn that night, and I went on to the name uh, this like name site that explained what the name was. And I scrolled down. Now some people will be aware, others won't be aware. I have weird experiences with the number fifty six. I have had uh, partially causal experiences, or what could be um, defined in causal terms. I've had a lot of experiences that can be defined in causal terms with the number 56, it popping up here and there just as coincidence, let's say. But I've also had quite a lot of synchronous experiences with the number 56. Um, and if you want to know what synchronicity is, it is in the Introduction to Jungian uh, Psychology video that I've already done. I think it's about two or three hours in. So if you look like skip to sort of that sort of range, you'll probably be nearing it. Um, I'd give you a timestamp, but I don't know it um, completely. Um, but it's it's definitely around that sort of area. It might be about a three hour point. Um, but anyway, I scrolled onto this page and I scrolled down. And then there was this sort of like weird little bar thing. I don't know what it was. It was defining some sort of accuracy thing or whatever it was. I thought it was a very, very weird thing to have on a name page like that. It was very weird. But there was this accuracy thing. And it the percentage on it was 56%. And then the name was called... Uh, the name meant uh, Beautiful, Kind, Courageous Leader. And that was Aralyn. And now that was spontaneous from the unconscious. That was a just some... That wasn't my conscious control. It just like this name just popped up in my mind. And then it led me to this website or to this set of causal events, let's say, that led me to the website that then had the letter, the, the number 56 on, which already had um, associations with myself anyway, and then said that the name actually was termed uh, beautiful, kind, courageous leader, which is like the, the spiritual... Um, figure of the anima that allows you to, uh, it's like a spiritual guide, let's say, that Jung calls the, the, the anima, that level of development is like the spiritual guide. So I was assured from that, that, uh, well, you know, I was assured in subjective means, like for myself, let's say, that, you know, this means something and that that was, that was, um, uh, that she was important. So anyway, so she's come to me many, 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 many times and I've had conversations with her and all the rest of it in active imagination a uh, very, very long time. Uh, and anyway, so she obviously, quite naturally, in this period, she's come to me a few times as well. And uh, there was this one... Um, uh, no, actually, there was two visions that were similar. And one of the visions was where Aralyn and this woman... This terrible, uh, like, yes, terrible mother, but also a part of uh, the anima. Where Aralyn and this terrible mother 
united into one, right? And it was weird, really weird vision, very quick vision, very brief vision, where Aralyn and this uh, anima, uh, this other negative anima figure, united into one, and then Aralyn, because she comes to me in, in white robes, Aralyn, I don't know why, that's just how she's come to me practically all the time, I don't think she's ever really been in anything else, it's just always been white robes, and I've had visions of her up in heaven as well, where I've like gone into this white, well, let's call it a white room, because I don't know whether it's heaven, that's a more of a subjective perception, but there's this white room, and I've gone up to this white room, and Aralyn's been there dressed in the white robes, and we've had like a very, very brief conversation. And also there's been visions where I've gone into like a, a really cool uh, visions where I've had, um, and these are more conscious visions, Let, there's not as much from the unconscious side, this is like the more mild form of active imagination, let's say, where I've been on like an, ob, uh, an oval table and Bads has been to the side of me there, Zareno or Ads has been to the side of me that way, and then Aralyn's been there, and we've literally had a four-way dialogue between, you know, between us, talking about what I need to do to get over certain things in my conscious life, it's the most mental thing ever, but it's so geniusly me, you know, um, so uh, I like those kind of things, but um, Aralyn came to me, and uh, in this kind of, and this really was just a spontaneous vision, this one, because uh, some of them, as I say, you can mediate a bit more with conscious control, and then other visions are solely like spontaneous, just boom, pop up, so anyway, she, those two folded together into one person, and then Aralyn was, oh, she's a very beautiful woman as well, uh, she basically, became a normal woman like in a in jean like she had jeans on and she had a t-shirt on red t-shirt on and um and then she was basically sat on my bed and she became a normal woman and that said to me that it's the negative quint and i, I knew I, I wish i knew this already because of so many dreams and so many active imagination sessions but it said to me that i've still not accepted and i, I as i say yeah uh, i kind of was aware of that, but this really highlighted it. I'm not accepting of that negative principle of the, the feminine there. And it's within the combination of the negative principle of the feminine and the very, very saintly, sagely, positive Aralyn figure, the union of them gets the normal human relationship with the woman, which then we, we would lead to suppose means that Aralyn was representative of Mary in terms of the anima development, the third stage of anima development, and then the negative principle of the feminine with possessed woman combining with Aralyn to create the normal human mortal woman. Um, uh, that, that's the, the slight little bit of coming down to earth that Jung talked about from the development of Mary to then Sophia. So that's, that was an interesting little play. And I've only realized that in retrospect. I didn't realize that when it was happening. I didn't even realize that slightly after it. It took me a few days to start to make those associations and stuff. So that was quite interesting. But of course, what I'm saying is that these figures can uh, take you to realms of which you become neurotic and become partially psychotic um, in your experience, so you do have to be careful with active imagination, it's not something that is just this, oh yes, it's all lovely, just go into this meditative state, and you're going to see all these lovely images, and then you're going to be able to interpret these images, and you're going to get this lovely, um, you know, this lovely experience where you're going to be more of a whole and holistic human being, it's not, it's not that easy, you know, Jung didn't say about um, individuation being more of a later life thing for no reason, he well knew that even if, let's say, um, you are a dream interpreter, uh, and you're interpreting your dreams, he knew, he, he very well knew that it's going to take years upon years upon years, and a lot of suffering, 
for you to actually um, be able to get to individuation. Uh, and so it's not this wonderful, oh yeah, you're going to be a whole person overnight or anything like that with active imagination. When, oh look, there's little gnomes flying about in the sky and all this. And it's like, oh yes, so they, they represent something nice for me and all that. No, it's, it's really, it's really not that. But I mean, sometimes you do get some nice experiences. Well, actually fairly often you can get some nice experiences in active imagination that are fun and interesting. But most of the time, they can even represent things that you might not want to actually know about yourself anyway. So you get that. But um, And also, of course, Jung, Jung said as well, my work will be continued by those who suffer. And he didn't just mean that in terms of uh, intellectual pursuits or anything like that. Of course, to continue the work of Jung, you need to be a, an incredibly intelligent person in terms of like knowing stuff. I mean, it's ridiculous. You'd have to know, to really properly continue his work, you'd have to know languages, you'd have to know uh, loads about mythology, loads about alchemy, loads about um, like kind of science in general, loads of stuff. But he didn't just mean in terms of those, in that terms of suffering and, and accumulating that sort of knowledge. But he also meant within active imagination. And he also meant within going down into the depths of the psyche and that sort of suffering as well. Um, um, but there's a lot of positives. There's a lot of positives with active imagination. There's a lot of positives with also learning in general and, and accumulating knowledge and stuff. Um, so, you know, that's what I kind of have like... Uh, I'm like that with that quote that he said, because it's like, well, I suppose there is like suffering within it, but also it's generally a a calling or a, a life purpose to do something like that. And so um, the suffering is synonymous with the happiness. I know that sounds really weird, but it's like, well, you're the one who's chosen to do it. And so you always have passion for it. You always love it. But also there is quite a lot of suffering involved. So it's kind of like both at the same time. Uh, anyway, should we get on to the meeting with the shadow? Now, we all know about the shadow. It's common speech now. Uh, you might not necessarily know when I say shadow or the shadow. You might not think immediately dark side. But the shadow is the dark side, and whenever we say dark side, we know we definitely know what we mean when we talk about that. So, you know, it's not hard for someone to get a basic understanding immediately from the conception, the shadow. Uh, the dark side of the personality. Well, not the dark side of the personality, but the, the unconscious personality or the unconscious um, autonomous personality that you've rejected in consciousness. So all the things in childhood and in development and in uh, even sort of adult years as well that you reject and that you push down into the unconscious. And then that forms, I mean, certainly in the early years, that forms the, the um, unconscious shadow personality. And of course, you have um, certain people who have, have positive shadows. I believe I've touched upon that before, but if I haven't, I'll talk, talk about it very briefly, about the whole idea that criminals, because they have a dark side consciously, they have a light side in the unconscious, their shadow is actually positive. That's why it's not correct to say that the, that the shadow is the dark side of a personality. It is the unconscious side of a personality in terms of the, the things that you reject, but they're not always negative. But for most people, the shadow is negative. Um, so we all have it, and we all do it. Uh, and if you say you don't do it, then uh, you're not understanding of your shadow. So it's like, for example, uh, a very, very, very mild part of my shadow that may live within my consciousness, for example, is, oh, I might not do something for my flatmates and I might be completely conscious of the fact I don't do it or I might not do this thing and someone was expecting me to do this thing and I don't do it or whatever it may be. That could be considered a very mild version of the shadow. And, you know, it, 
by the by, you don't, you know, um, it's just within your consciousness and it's something that is a slightly, uh, ne- just a, in a very, very slight terms, a slight negative element to your personality. And uh, it's something that also allows for what I would say, kind of like a, an alleviation of the instincts. So what I mean by that is, imagine if you didn't do like certain little things that are a bit rascal like okay for example um maybe you like you you're one of these people who just likes to play a little bit just a little bit of a trick on someone every now and then you see if you didn't do that it might be that you get quite frustrated it might be that you get quite kind of uh you know just this kind of anger within you or this kind of shadowiness within you that just doesn't get expression and therefore it kind of constellates in the unconscious and and then you might start to actually become over a period of time uh, because obviously that's not just going to stay there it might just end up coming out in your behavior unconsciously in certain ways and you might become a little bit kind of just assertive or not very nice towards people in a more uncontrolled way you see because when the shadows integrated um, you might be kind of a bit of an assertive personality anyway, but it's kind of in a controlled and uh, uh, certain directed manner that is appropriate for the situation, shall we say. And therefore, it's in your conscious control. You've integrated your shadow there. And, um, you know, it's not, it's fine. It's just that, as it is, basically. Um, but when you haven't done that, then it starts to come out in more unconscious ways and maybe you're a bit aggressive towards people, but not in a, not in a controlled manner or anything like that. Um, or opposite to that as well, because it quite, can quite be the opposite. You're, just a re- you're basically just a persona and you really just... Uh, you're basically really, really nice to people and you're just really agreeable. Um, in trait structure, I've talked about this before, but in... Um, uh, big five traits, which are which have genetic components. Agreeableness is basically the persona. Disagreeableness is the shadow. It's basically that. And if you ran correlational tests on it, you would find that agreeableness relates to the persona very, very highly. Um, with a strong, um, it would be a strong correlation, and disagreeableness to the shadow. And again, it would be a strong correlation because it's just the same. It's just explaining the same phenomenon, but in different ways. Um. But yeah, so you might be a persona, so you'll be nice and agreeable and all that sort of stuff. Um, but you, there's different ways the shadow works because you can have that kind of shadow where it's not really integrated into the personality. Um, and so it's projected out onto people and then people get really angry at those people. Now, that isn't a, an integration with the shadow. That's just a projection of the shadow and a and uh, uh, an inability to utilize it in an appropriate manner consciously. Um, so you might think, well, that person's quite angry and stuff. They must have integration with their shadow. Well, no, it's, it's not that. It might be that they're projecting out and, the, and then they're obviously... Um, they're not really accepting of those kind of evil traits within within themselves or those kind of like little things that they dislike in someone else inside themselves. Um, and then, of course, if you see someone who's overly agreeable, um, then, you know, they might not have much of an integration with the shadow. Um, and then, of course, the individual who has an integration with the shadow, you'll be able to see it within them, in their behavior and reactions and things like that. You can tell that they're not an agreeable person. You can tell that they're not like really, uh, oh, I'm just going to service you or anything like that. You can you can tell that they're kind of, uh, they've got a bit of, uh, what's the Jewish word? Huxpur, Huxpur, something like that. Anyway, we've got a little bit of that, you know, drive, a little bit of that you know, uh, passion and stuff and, and so, certain almost kind of um, uh, directedness in, in, in almost a little bit of a negative way um, in terms of their behavior. It could, you could quite easily label it as a, as a negative connotation, but it's a negative connotation in its correct place. Um, and uh, so you get people and, and, the, and it's very beautiful as well when people integrate the shadow because you really start to see them come out 
Because when, let's say, you've just got a persona, and I know this strictly from person, well, not strictly from personal experience, but from other, from obviously observations as well as other people and uh, reading Young and all the rest of it, but a lot from personal experience, I know it. When you're a persona, you do hide a little bit of yourself, or in some cases, a lot of yourself. And then it gives you this kind of mm, odd insincerity. And people notice that. People pick up on that. They're not, people aren't stupid in that way. People know that. People know that there's like a bit of a persona there, or you're holding something back. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just not like great. You know, it's not, it's not the best. But then, when someone integrates a shadow, you see a bit more of them come to light and you actually see like their personality in a, a more whole sense because they've got that thing from the unconscious that was in the unconscious and maybe that was even suppressed or repressed a little bit. And uh, they've got that now and they're, it's an addition to their personality that actually makes them actually appear more of a person. And actually appear, make them appear more beautiful in a sense. You know, like the, the, the whole idea that I always reference um, about, the you know, you put manure on crops and the cro crops grow really big and beautiful and all the rest of it. And I swear I've got that from Alan Watts, but I, I, I don't know. It might be Alan Watts. It might be someone else. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, that's what happens. It's because you're putting that, that crap of the shadow, all of that crap, Basically, manure is just poo, and 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 that's let's say representing the shadow, and you're putting that onto the, the the already existent crops of your conscious personality, and it's making it flower a lot more. You know, people like it when someone's a bit sort of got a bit of fight. You know, I I I try and draw that out of people because I don't like it. I don't like it when people don't have that little bit of fight and stuff, and. Uh, you know, personally, my meeting with the shadow and my disintegration with the shadow, you know, there's plenty of work that I need to do on the shadow. I, I understand that. But I do like, um, I, I do like bringing it out of people a little bit, you know, and certainly when people are displaying a lot of agreeableness, I generally kind of take a bit more of a stance of uh, being slightly more disagreeable to an extent that maybe doesn't, color me like in in incredibly bad light or anything like that but i'll just be a bit uh a bit disagreeable here and there and it then just gets them out the shell a bit and it gives them especially over time if you if you've got a friend and they're like that and you do that every time you meet them to a certain degree um then over time they do open up and then you can see that assertiveness and that shadow come out and it's it's a wonderful experience you see it's you don't actually, people don't generally need therapy. They just need a friend who is a little bit of a trickster. It's a little bit of what you would classify uh, in, you know, the spiritual tradition as a rascal guru, as someone who gets someone out of the shell and gets someone out of just that one-sidedness of experience. Um, and so if you have a friend like that, and there's many people like that around who aren't, don't have any affiliations with spirituality, but they just, they like that. They, they're very, very good judges of character and they can naturally, quite unconsciously to themselves even, um, help integrate another person. And what we would call those people is naturally individuated people um, and, or um, not necessarily just naturally individuated people, but uh the only, the only way I can describe it, the only way I can describe the phenomenon is uh, in terms that I've created myself, which is in, in terms of what I call the invisible sage, which is basically someone who's naturally individuated, who also in their actions unconsciously goes to help develop the, the psychology um, of another individual without themselves even knowing it. It's crazy. But well, these people exist. And if you perceive it in reality, uh, if you if you've got a good eye, if you're quite intuitive, you'll be able to see these people working in the social context and see how actually, even though they're not trying to do it or they're unconscious of it, they are actually integrating other people. And what that actually is in Jungian terms is the self working through those individuals to integrate another individual and get that other individual individual closer to individuation over the long term. So yeah, you know, I quite like to do that. You know, just 
help people along like that. I mean, it's like in this flat when I first got here, the girls were, well, you know, now I, I understand actually. Now, uh, from well, from certainly an internal um, uh, kind of uh, a more kind of... Uh, when then when they're in an environment where they're comfortable with people they they actually can be uh assertive and I like that um but when I first got here, I didn't really see see that in them, and it was in them it was just because of course they were in a new group they were a bit more reserved and all the rest of it so obviously when I first got here, I was very very uh, shadowy I just laid my shadow on the table basically I was just um proper. I was quite loud and stuff and all the rest of it and quite, you know, knocking the chairs around and things like that. And and uh, I, I very well knew full well that, you know, the girls, uh, I wanted to get the girls out of the shell, you know, and, uh, and unbeknownst to me, actually, uh, they're more out of their shell prior to, to any of that than, than I'd realised. Um but certainly in a social context, the, you know, I mean, like myself as well and like other people, um, you know, having a bit more of assertion there would be good. Um, but no, it's a very, uh, it's a very interesting thing with Shadow and being able to um, play with it as well and to indulge in it a little bit. Now, the meeting of the Shadow is not a nice one. And... How come that's not? Oh, there we go. That's it. That's what I'm trying to do. Well, maybe I've gone a bit far down. Oh, now I've gone too far down. That's about, that's better. That's okay. That's not too bad. Um, now, the meeting of the shadow isn't a very nice one. The meeting of the shadow is, uh, well, I mean, it can take all sorts of forms. Um, in dreams, you might have harrowing meetings with shadowy figures, with men, you know, or, or women even, who are very uh, overbearing or may make you feel quite um, nervous or scared and things like that. Um, you might have meetings with certain people in history who you can obviously call to mind as being um, negative individuals, negative figures. Um, within the, the history of mankind, things like that. Um, you may have dreams in which, in fact, you're doing something quite shadowy uh, within the context of the dream. Uh, and this goes from to all different levels. It goes to all different levels. Um, it can be a very, very harrowing experience and can go to quite a high level, quite an extreme level, or it can be not so much of a harrowing experience, and it can just be a bit shadowy. For example, you might have a dream with uh, you've you've just parked your car somewhere, and uh, you go off and you have lunch, and then you come back, and then there's this uh, big burly ticket guy, a really big guy, or you might say, well, there's this very very stern looking woman there. Um, doesn't really matter, whatever it is, just someone to you who would be who would scare you, right? Um, and so you might have that and then they have an argument with you and they're very, very pressing with that and they're very in your face with that. And, and that, of course, is a partial shadow dream. You know, there's, an, there's a shadow element to that dream. There may be other things that go on in the dream as well that, that uh, you need to obviously analyze and things like that. But that's just a very typical kind of, you know, shadowy type dream, you know, sort of, sort of like a normal individual would have. Uh, and, and then, of course, that's showing that there's an element of the shadow uh, within that. Now, uh, to interpret that dream uh, in more depth, obviously, really depends on the individual and stuff. And you could possibly uh, associate that with certain things in the individual's life that, that actually correlate and that maybe they need to be assertive in a certain way or whatever, you may be able to find that out. Um, or it may be, there might be some other things in the dream that, that correlate to the shadow and that allow you to, to figure out for that specific person how they need to integrate the shadow or what situations might be, uh, the shadow might be lacking within, let's say. Uh, and I've done that with myself as well, where there's certain situations where I think, oh, I know what that dream's telling me. It's telling me about the shadow. It's telling me this specific thing about it. So 
I need to potentially be a bit more conscious of that in my waking life and uh, maybe uh, adopt a slightly different response, maybe adopt a slightly more assertive response than I would have done previously. But now I've had that dream, I can be conscious of it and I know what to do uh, in the future. Now, the personal shadow, of course, is all of the prejudices and the things that, uh, and all, all those kind of sides of your personality and stuff that you rejected. And so those will come up in dreams and that will, uh, they'll try and integrate certain things with you in that sense. But there'll also be, potentially be collective dreams, which might be mass destructions and things like that. So you might have um, a, a big, massive, battle with two armies, right? So there might be a, a bad army and a good army. And, uh, and this is more like a collective dream, but a, a little bit less common. And it might be a very vivid dream. It might be very intense. And these armies are battling each other out. And there might even been scenes before this in an archetypal dream, which is like the two leaders of the army have got together. And the, at first, they're talking to each other and discussing some sort of terms. And then maybe the terms fall through. And then they start having arguments and all the rest of it. And then it leads up to a big battle and all the rest of it. So it might it'll be quite intricate. And there'll be loads of different things going on in an archetypal dream like that. Loads of different characters, loads of different themes happening. Um, and that is the whole uh, eternal, well, you know, eternal, let's say, eternal um, battle of good versus evil, you know, the, the yin and the yang and all, you know, well, the yang and the yin even, uh, and all that sort of stuff and the de God and the devil. And that's kind of the, the more collective level of, of uh, a substructure of the psyche, which is portraying itself in an archetypal dream within your own psyche and you see them a lot i've had quite a lot of those um uh and you also get like ones where you, you might be battling animals so the animals might be representing some sort of shadowy nature like for example uh the tiger yes it can represent the shadow it can also represent the, sh uh, the feminine because it's a yin animal um but certainly things like the crow, you know, and stuff like that, that can be a quite a shadowy animal. And I just had a dream not long ago with crows in. Um, and so that could be a shadowy animal. So that could be representative or it might be you might battle with crows within the dream. It's probably more likely uh, to be representative of some sort of negative force. Uh, than maybe you're actually doing battle with crows, although saying that I have had a dream doing battle with crows, so there you go, it can happen. Um, but there's obviously all these animals that, that can correspond to that and that then can be uh, symbolising that kind of battle with the shadow on a more collective level. Of course, there can be murders in dreams and things like that and quite harrowing things like that. And... Um, the thing we we have two levels of experience because we have the the individual who is the personal individual who isn't indulging with psychology or isn't indulging with philosophy or isn't uh let's say isn't a sage in the sense of there's a certain way of the sage and what I mean by that is. There's certain things that a good sage has to integrate within them. And the normal individual who partakes in life only really is concerned with the, the personal shadow. And when, obviously, they're coming in for therapy and things like that, you really can, they might have a few collective dreams, of course, and then you will interpret the um, uh, collective dreams because then that gives you more insight into what's actually happening in the archetypal structure of, of that person's psyche but really you're wanting to get to the personal shadow you're wanting to integrate those things because that's what's going to integrate that individual really now uh of course with certain individuals you then get to the collective and then you can obviously um you see for me personally it has to be certain individuals with a certain trait structure so, for example, if you've got someone who really isn't interested in 
spiritual or religious ideas or anything like that. Maybe they're high in trait conscientious, uh, in trait conscientiousness. Maybe they're in a certain field that is totally disconnected to spiritual or religious ideas. There's not really, in my personal opinion, any point in trying to integrate them on a high level with regards to the collective uh, psyche. Your focus is the personal psyche, but with, let's say, a sage, the sage has to go through all of it. So the personal individual who goes through life, uh, obviously indulging in uh, whatever job or whatever role they're, they're indulging in, in needs to integrate the personal shadow and get wholeness in that respect and potentially get to natural individuation. And that's a good thing, and that's a positive thing, and that will really, really cement their mental health. But the individual who is the sage goes to the deeper level and has to uh, integrate the um, the shadow on the real collective level. And that's going along with individuation. That's going along a spiritual journey, an actual spiritual awakening, and then uh, getting to the highest level of nearing enlightenment that you can get to as a mortal and imperfect human. So that's then the way of the sage. So the sage will have uh, or will need to interpret all of these collective dreams uh, and, and understand the real collective substructure of, um, uh, well, let's say reality um, in their kind of individuation process. Now, it's not always the case that they need to interpret their collective dreams because in a spiritual journey, what actually happens is that the elements get integrated uh, partially unconsciously because the individual, um, how do I explain this? It's quite hard to explain. They don't need to directly interpret their dreams to gain the knowledge of collective good and evil, shall we say. They don't they they get the knowledge of the the self and the collective good and evil and things like that and the uh non-dualism and all that sort of stuff without necessarily interpreting their dreams. But if they were to interpret their dreams, they would see this uh playing, they would see this integration process happening within their dreams, right? So as someone who's on a spiritual journey in their waking life will always be concerning themselves with uh, trying to understand spiritual concepts and trying to uh, uh, meditate on those and contemplate on those and all the rest of it and, and throw away the ego and all that sort of stuff, all that kind of stuff that goes, goes on. And of course, there's uh, folly in that. There's a lot of folly in, in all those kind of things, and especially the whole throwing away the ego and stuff. But they'll do that, and uh, while they're doing that, this process will go on in the unconscious, and uh, they may have archetypal dreams and things like that, but if they don't interpret their dreams, they won't see that there's this process aligning up with the outer process as well. Um, and uh, so there's those two kind of categories, there's those two kind of things happening at the same time. And... Uh, the person gets realization of the self and realization of, well, yes, it's realization of the self in spiritual awakening, but it's not individuation per se. But if they get realization of the self and the whole good and evil and the, um, the uh, implicit nature of those two in the sense that they are non-dual and they can't be separated and all the rest of it, um, and they'll get that. And there'll, there'll have been this inner process going on at the same time. And that's the way of the sage. And the sage has to go through that process specifically. The personal individual who's concerned with the affairs of whatever they're doing, uh, they merely need to integrate the personal unconscious. And I would say in certain circumstances, it's not necessary to get them to that collective stage because it's not within their individuation. Or, or, or shall we say, not within their individuation, but rather it's not within their natural individual. They're, they're more destined for a natural individuation rather than an individuation. Although saying that leads us to some level of prejudice because then we think, well, how do I know who is and who isn't 
So then we start to say, well, it might be better in a certain degree not to judge it like that, like certain psychologists do judge it like that if they're using the Jungian idea, um, but not to judge it like that, but instead just to work on it at a collective level for every individual. Um, but it is very, very likely that certain individuals won't get to conscious individuation anyway, um, because that is more in line with the way of certain individuals and certain uh, sagacious individuals. So uh, the way of the sage is a little bit different. The way of the sage of integrating the shadow is a little bit different. Now, we also have to think about um, the shadow in the context of the hero's journey and the shadow in the context of um, within, within the sage, the shadow in the sage. So um, you all know that when someone's, the person who's got to catch a murderer, right, the investigator and all that sort of stuff, he or she or they have to think, to a certain degree at least, like the murderer, murderer would think, to be able to capture the murderer. And so that person, that investigator, who is, a, who is primarily a force for good in the world, has to be shadowy to the extent that they can actually capture the murderer. And that level of shadow is actually to quite a high extent because they have to always try to be one ahead of the murderer so that they can cut them off and the murderer doesn't just end up escaping. So they have to be quite a shadowy, tough, assertive individual. And it's just as it is working in the police force, especially within certain roles. And uh, so the individual who is a force for good in the world always has to have a strong evil side or a strong shadow to be able to beat out the person who's actually using their shadow, utilizing their shadow for the horrific negative purpose of it, killing, brutality, subjugation, all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of quite odd, isn't it? If you think that uh, to be a good person in this world, I mean, to really be a good person of of being able to uh, organize the world, being able to provide new ideas to the world, being able to actually um, run the world as well, you need to have a strong element of the shadow within you. And this also uh, relates to the way of the sage in terms of like the uh, shadow that needs to be present in the sage if that person is going to be a sage within X field, Y field, Z field, whatever. To get to that position, they need to have um, the utilization of the energy from the shadow um, to... To put it in quite a shadowy way verbally to dominate other individuals in the field so that then they can get to the position that they need to be at as the sage, let's say. Because the other people, uh, it basically organizes itself, let's say, uh, you know, in, in the hierarchical terms of it, it organizes itself anyway because the person with the partial shadow, you know, the, the um, affiliation with the shadow, and who is the sage, i.e. is potentially well-read on this subject or a number of subjects, um, has been through the spiritual journey and all that sort of stuff, they naturally will get to the top. But in order to do that, they need the integration with their shadow to have that energy to be able to get there. Now, this also works in another way as well. So, if let's say you've got someone who is quite a shadowy individual, but in the wrong way, in a very kind of self-interest, um, kind of, I want to get to the top to 
basically for the sake of ruling and for the sake of um, getting to the top and employing my ideology, shall we say, then the sage, the person who's actually more good but employs their shadow to be able to get to the top, needs to use, needs that shadow equally to beat out that other guy who is more of, let's say, a bastard and who, if he gets to the top, he'll really muck the show up. So the sage also in that setting needs a shadow to be able to utilize it to get over that guy and to actually be the person in control who will be fair, open, honest, etc. But there always needs to be an element of, of dominance within that sage, an element of negativity within that sage and, and evil to be able to get to, to that space so that then they can do their, their good work. Now, where we have to be careful is in this idea of there's basically two things, and these two things separate, um, let's say, an inherently, well, not, an, I don't want to say the word inherently, actually, but separate a good sage from someone who is um, going to be quite evil. And these are the, the two things, really. Individualized goals compared to collective goals, okay? So it's fine to have certain individualized goals. It's okay to have that. But the sage generally is one who always thinks with the collective in mind. Therefore, they, they learn and they uh, think and they help and they absorb themselves in things that are always towards a meaningful collective goal, i.e. getting the good of the collective. And of course, that's what we would say a good politician would do if there were so people of good politicians. Um, but as of yet, and I do not know anything about politics uh, except from the experiences that I've had with watching elections and watching bits of interviews here and there with people, but I have not seen a bloody good politician as of yet. But well, Obama for me was okay. Obama was decent, but like other than that, I mean, Boris did okay, I suppose, with lockdown, but, you know, he could have done a lot better. Like, he, he was all over the shop with regards to lockdown, then not lockdown, then, oh, we're opening back up, and then, right, we'll partially close down again, and then, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, And, of course, there's there's a lot of persona in that as well, because it's like, well... Boris is trying to please the nation as a persona, let's say. As, as he wants to make sure that the nation is being pleased and he's not going to uh, get too riled up. But at the same time, he needs to make a decision and all the rest of it. So um, it's kind of like there is a bit of that persona in there and that can kind of distort the, the correct decisions that are being made. If uh, you were to get rid of that persona and make you know, these decisions as, 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 then you've got a bit of uh, more leeway. For example, um, uh, you just say, look, it's not going to be good. This is what we've got to do. We've got to clamp down on this straight away. Um, and, uh, and we don't know what it's going to look like. We, we are not going to open up until it is absolutely necessary. I'm sorry, guys, but we are not, you know, and then that would be a, a more firm, directed boom. And, and and of course, he did do that, and he did try to do that quite, quite well, but there's always this kind of, um, well, you know, you have to, you have to make sure that the country is being pleased, and you have to make sure that they are uh, staying healthy and all the rest of it, specifically in the pandemic with regards to mental health. Um, but sometimes what is necessary is more of a kind of boom, you know, right down, uh, and, 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 and less of a, let's say feeling response, but ultimately that can get you in other areas and stuff as well. But anyway, um, the, so the good sage will always have direction on the collective, on the good of the collective, not on an individualized goal per se. Of course, 
within their life, they may, may have some sort of individualized goals. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think what sort of individualized goals they would have because, like, when I think of myself, I've kind of partially abandoned because when I started to think about this kind of what route to go down, where how to orient myself and things like that, and, and I've thought about that quite a lot. When I've thought about that and I've gone down that, I've started to more and more wheedle off the individualized goals because it's like, well, I don't need them because I love psychology, I love philosophy. And it's like, well, I do that and I speak what I'm speaking and that helps people and that's more to me as a collective goal. I mean, yeah, okay, you could argue that it's both individual and collective because I like psychology. So, of course, it's kind of an individual individual goal. But at the same time, it's more of a collective goal because it's just what I have to do. And it's like just my calling and uh, I, I do it to be able to share something with people so then some people are helped and stuff like that. So I don't see in my own psychology and in observing others as well, where the sage would actually have necessarily any any individual, really in, individualized goals. Um, except maybe little things in their personal life, I would say, but that's that's by the by, really. Um, so they're always directed at the collective. They're always directed at the good of of man, let's say, or the good of human uh, humanity. Um, so that person has always got to have that. They've always got to have that little bit of shadowiness. There is no point in being the prime minister or the president and not being able to stand up for yourself and not being able to have that real integration with not only the personal shadow specifically, but even like a little bit of the collective shadow, um, even a little bit of that that level of evil and, you know, being able to really fight your corner because that's high up in in, uh, well, within these fields, and you really do have to make sure that you, you have that to be able to hold the position there, and to then be able, because you need to hold your position there, to be able to put these things in place that will then help the collective good of humanity. So, you know, it's kind of like it's necessary for that, as I've said. So uh, that's another thing that, that kind of um, the sage... More has you see so so what I, what you can kind of do is you can split people and you can split society as a whole into um, this kind of mentality. So you've got many many the majority of individuals out there individualized goals in life. You know when you're fourteen, fifteen or so, you think, well, oh, what am I going to do at my options? Well, I wonder what I want to be. I wonder what I'll do, and then you think, well. I'll do these at my options and then I'll go on and then do this at college and then university or whatever. And these are all qualifications that in the normal person's mind, they think, oh, well, this goes to better my development or my CV or my this or my that. Whereas that's all for the, for the individual thinking about the good of the collective of humanity. It's not, that's just like, well, yeah, I suppose you know that's some sort of level of education and stuff and that's brilliant but i know that a bloody piece of paper don't mean anything you know i'm gonna be dead don't matter don't matter about me you know so so the the individual focused on the collective gets rid of all of the conceptual framework of society and and just directs their attention towards uh it's almost like intellectual rebellion in a sense uh, or, or just rebellion anyway, like in a general sense of I'm going to direct my attention on uh, the things that I need to learn for the collective good. And then I'm going to, uh, and, and obviously within within doing that, you obviously better yourself to a high degree as well, in, uh, you know, along that process. And then you uh, uh, get yourself into a position where you're, um, let's say, being able to slowly rise up uh, to a position of power, which then you can really influence things in a positive manner. But that's all of a 
generally a collective thing rather than uh, particularly so much of an individual thing. Because your your mind has always been on the greater good, the wider picture. Whereas the individualized person, oh, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll get this job. And, uh, you know, if I'm lucky, I'll get up the ladder a bit, get a bit more money and all that sort of stuff. And uh, and then I might be able to get myself a good house and I'll get myself a good car and I'll get myself all these, uh, you, know, you know, maybe these nice things and stuff, all, all the rest of it. And, uh, oh, I treat myself to this and that. and all, yeah. So that's more of a, of a narrow individualized focus on life in like this, this, this and this. Whereas the collective individual is solely like, well, crap all that all that just gets bit that that just goes in the bin after a few years anyway that's all just hedonism that's all just you know you trying to better yourself better better yourself in terms of external materials um which, which really just they just fall apart and they just can't serve you to a to a real high degree in the end what will really serve you to a high degree is committing yourself to um this wider Thing. And that's what, that is exactly what the hero's journey means. That's exactly what, let's say, this idea of the way of the sage means. It means overcoming um, this kind of individualized mentality and just trying to, you know, get things, accumulate things for your ego, for yourself, and instead uh, try and do things for the world, for the collective good. That's why Joseph Campbell said a hero is someone who, well, I'm, like, I'm going to have to tell <laughs> a hero is someone, let me see how I can remember it. A hero is someone who takes on something greater than themselves. It's something like that. A hero is someone who takes on uh, something greater than themselves. So it's not it's not you're indulging in a in an individual passion, but in mythological terms, within the idea of the hero's journey, and also as a psychological representation of that, because it's the mythology is almost a representation of the psychological phenomenon, and you vice versa, really. Um, and so uh, it's having a collective goal, a, an overcoming of. Uh, in mythological terms, the the dragon of society, if you will, or anything like that, and then taking a place and taking a stand with uh, a rebellion of new ideas, and then the new ideas come in politically, wh whatever it may be, psychologically, philosophically, or whatever, by one of these great individuals, and then you you, you know you've society has progressed and all the rest of it, and it's not only great individuals because there's hundreds of thousands of sages out there. I'm talking people who are spiritually awakened, probably millions, in fact. I've, tried, I've always tried to pinpoint a number on how many spiritually awakened people there are probably in the world. And I don't, I can't, like, understand. It's got to be millions. It's got to be millions. There's so many people who are. Who are. Like, it, it's, more, it's more than you think. It is more than you think. But saying that, I only know of one other person at university who has actually had the spiritual experiences that obviously then they they understand spiritual awakening and know it from experience. Um, and so, I don't know. But, but I mean, you know, generally people don't get spiritually awakened at like 18 or 19 or 20, which are the people here. Um, it's at minimum like your early, mid or later, you know, it might be early, mid, 20s or later. Um, uh, you know, I mean, 18 is quite, quite young, really, for that sort of stuff. I'm not saying the people who aren't, who don't, you know, don't get that at that age, but it's like, it's a bit, it's a bit young. Um, so, yeah, you know, so there's loads of those people in the world. So it's not just that you've got this one, let's say, heroic world redeemer or societal redeemer who comes through and is this Jesus-like figure. It's nothing like that. Um, although you do get those people, of course, throughout history, like you'll get your really, really incredible sage who is almost like that level. But generally, it's just all these kind of normal, 
average human beings who happen to have had some sort of experience with spirituality and they uh, send their message to the world through the medium that they have to send their message to the world through. And they all go to make up uh, one great world redeemer, if you if you will, in an analogy. Like all of the millions of spiritually awakened individuals in the world help to integrate and help to um, kind of progress um, from the standpoint of collective good uh, the world and um, and help people within it and help people um, feel more contented in themselves, help people uh, psychologically or the rest of it. So um, that's that's quite an interesting idea as well. Um, and, and, uh, it's something that I want to explore more. Like I do want to, I am thinking potentially that the psychology of religion is one field that if I'm going to go down the route of, uh, uh, scientific psychology, that's one of the routes I'd go down. Um, I'd probably do it in a neuropsychological setting if I did it, um, rather than like self-report questionnaires and things, cause there's obvious issues with self-report questionnaires. Like, for example, the lack of honesty that people can sometimes have or uh, the fact that people just rush through the questionnaire to get it done on time. And there are like ways in which you can stop people from doing that and get some more, well, slightly more genuine results and stuff. I mean, generally, a lot of people are quite good and they will be honest and they, they will take time with questionnaires, but there are those who don't. And so there are ways to get around that, but... um it's just I don't really think the self-report questionnaires are, like, brilliant for studies. And there's so many studies now that do, that this, well, even, like, in the past few years, that, that still do a lot of questionnaires. And I guess it probably is quite easy, really, if you think about it, to structure a questionnaire and do it that way. I mean, I suppose definitely if you're doing it online and you're just saying, right, I've, I've collected these 2,000 participants from, from somewhere, I don't know where, but... I've collected these participants. I'm going to give them this questionnaire. And then you've got a sample, a sample size of 2,000 there. You've not even had to go out your bloody room because you've just done all your questionnaire on your room and got it set up via email or whatever with these participants from a particular platform that you can recruit them from. And, uh, and then bugger it, you know, you've done it. You've basically done a study. So I can see why people do it. But it's like, to me, it's just... You know, like doing an event-related potential thing on the brain, that seems more concrete and more solid for me. So um, I would probably do uh, things like that if I, were getting in, if I was getting into the psychology of religion. Um, and that would be quite interesting. But anyway, so uh, yeah, so uh, that's kind of the, the whole thing with with meeting the shadow, I suppose, and it can be very, very brutal, and it can be those just really to finish as well. It can be over such a long time period with so many dreams, and I mean, I've I've tried to pinpoint how when I've been integrating the shadow, and when like for how long I've been integrating the shadow, and uh, I mean, I can't define consciously a complete correct answer with that because. I don't know what's been unconscious to me and I don't know what sort of development has been unconscious to me prior to um, sort of my conscious realization of me integrating the shadow. But certainly I must have been slowly integrating the shadow for at least the last two, three, four years. Um, I'd say three years at least, maybe four years, because the whole idea of Bads, Bads Robinson, which is personalized representation of the collective shadow, he... Um, came to me as a character which was expressive of certain disintegrated things within my psyche at that time and still partially now um and that was what four years ago now that character four years ago I really started with that character so and don't forget the unconscious prior to that was most likely integrating my shadow unconsciously slowly bringing that trying to push that into consciousness a little bit more, even without me knowing. So it's very likely that your unconscious have tried, been trying to integrate my shadow for a, a good number of years, and it still is doing that at the moment, it, unconsciously and consciously with what I know. Um, 
Uh, and so it's a very, very long process. And it isn't just something that you think, well, oh, yes, I've integrated my shadow now. That's, you know, it's so ambiguous. You can't just say, well, that's, I've, I've done it, you know, and that's that. It's like the animal animus. It's, it's, yes, there are certain conceptual frameworks that you can put the animal animus into and the, the shadow into. And you can think, well, okay, I really do feel as if I've integrated them now. I feel as if I'm closer to integration. Yeah, you can definitely, um, uh, in uh, sort of um, interpret it or have some sort of level of intuition around that sort of understanding and you can kind of feel as if that's kind of what it is but you never know whether your consciousness is just distorting your viewpoint because um, certain points I've thought to myself quite naively oh yeah I've integrated my shadow now or I've done this or I've done that and um and then I only fall flat on my face when I, I realize from interpreting dreams in the future or from doing things and experience and all the rest of it, um, from maybe being a bit too much of a persona here or persona there or whatever. And then I start to think, oh, no, no, there's, there's no way I've integrated my shadow fully yet. So, you know, it goes like that. It's really kind of... Um, uh, you just have to indulge in the experience, indulge in the dreams, indulge in active imagination, keep your focus on your progression with your psychology, and then at some point, things will get a little bit more whole and a little bit more unified and a little bit more um, steady. And then once you've got that kind of steadiness, well, it, it doesn't really matter whether you whether you perceive yourself to be integrated or not, at least you've got that level of steadiness. Uh, of course, I mentioned in the individuation video, which you may have seen already, it may have come out, or maybe it's not come out, but I mentioned how Jung talks about the animus being uh, uh, basically having sort of like an inflationary mechanism, which is where the animus upon uh, sort of like a, a premature version of individuation uh, feels, uh, get, gains identification with the self and feels it, as if it's gained individuation. That's, as far as I'm concerned, that is probably the biggest pitfall of your, what practically one of the biggest pitfalls of Jungian psychology. There are quite a few, but that is one of them. That is one of the big ones because that is what we would term uh, inflation, ego inflation or delusions of grandeur in modern day speech. Um, and so that is, you know, that's a big one. That's a big one. And and I think a lot of people do, myself included, go through that uh, to varying degrees, depending on their already their kind of current underlying state of their psychology. And so it's something that you have to recognize and you have to send to yourself and you have to realize that, uh, oh no, there's no way I'm at individuation yet, or there's no way I'm close to that. And when you look at your dreams, you quite clearly see that. You're quite, oh, well, yeah, of course, bloody hell, I've not integrated my shadow. Of course, I've not, uh, I, I'm clueless when it comes to the anima or, or the animus or whatever it may be. So as your experience progresses, you get these newfound experiences and then you think, oh, well, uh, or these newfound kind of attributes of experience, and you think, oh, of course, yeah, bloody hell, I'm, I'm ridiculous with this, I'm nowhere near, you know, and then that humbles you and then takes you out of that, uh, or at least it helps take you out of that a little bit, and it allows you to center yourself and 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 just be, you know, uh, human. I think that's a good word. It, it, it helps you be human rather than deluded or rather than, in a in a state of uh, inflation or anything like that. So, but it's very very hard because you're always, as I've said before, like you you can be always battling with that. You can always be battling back and forth with that, especially if you've got a certain tendency. Especially as I say, if you've got a certain underlying psychology, if you've got certain complexes or whatever it may be, you're always battling with that. That is one of the things that can, you can be always battling with. And no wonder pride is one of the seven deadly sins as well, you know. Um, whether we're taking it from a religious viewpoint or, or an atheistic viewpoint, pride, obviously, uh, in in uh, excessive measure, is, is going to corrupt you, is going to make you into a person who uh, is, is grandiose, you know. And, and so uh, that's not necessarily a good thing. 
Um, so anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for watching, guys. That has been on. That's been a good little bit on uh, active imagination and meeting the shadow as well. Um, that's not too bad actually. We've, we've done two hours of that. You see, really to fully understand these concepts, we really kind of have to go quite deep. That Jungian video that uh, I did an introduction on, I probably spent twenty minutes on each of these. Like, I probably spent like. 20 minutes on the shadow or 10 minutes on the shadow or 20 minutes on active. I mean, it did come out at a four hour video, four and a half hour video. Uh, but that was obviously because there was so many things to cover in it, but that was merely an introduction. Uh, now going deeper on some of these elements is necessary and, uh, we can really start to understand them to a, to a better, better degree. Um, but no, the, the Jungian ideas, God, you can talk for, hours upon hours upon hours because the, the intricacies with them is, is ridiculous and you could be literally talking hours 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 so you you know to be able to get a good understanding of these concepts it's going to take us a while to move through this and to uh help understand uh certain things within Jungian psychology but anyway i'll leave it there guys thank you very much for watching and i will see you in the next one See you very soon, guys.